Hello everybody, welcome to our second video together. Uh, we're going to discuss chapter 1.5 and in this chapter we're going to be identifying functions. So we want to identify and graph linear and quadratic functions, cubic, square root, and reciprocal functions. A step and piecewise functions we'll also discuss. And then uh, we also just want to get in the habit of recognizing these common functions. Alright, let's get started. Uh, the first one we're going to discuss is linear. Linear functions, and remember the classic y equals mx plus b. That's pretty much the name of the game for all linear functions. Sorry, we can't see that earlier. Uh, let's do a quick example. Because remember, this isn't the only form we can use for linear functions. So sometimes it's useful to use other forms. So uh, say we're asked to write the linear equation uh, for fancy f, and that just means for the function, uh, when f of 1 equals 3 and f of 4 equals 0. Uh, the first thing's first, what's important to realize that they gave us here is that they essentially gave us two coordinates. They gave us an x value and a y value, so we know 1 comma 3 is a coordinate. And they gave us an x and a y again, so we know that we have 4 comma 0 as a coordinate as well. Uh, and to begin finding the equation of this line, it's going to be important for us to know what the slope is. So let's find m. Remember, m is just the change in y over the change in x. And we find that by taking our y's, 0 minus 3 find the difference, and then find the difference with our x's as well. So we're going to do 4 minus 1. And when we find that, we get negative 3 over 3, which is negative 1. And so now we have a point. And we can just pick one of the two they gave us. Let's pick this one. Uh, we have a point 1, 3, and we have an m value, uh, negative 1. And since we have a slope and a point to find the equation, it's going to be useful for us to use the uh, what was I going to say? Um, the point-slope form. <laughs> there we go. Point-slope form. When you're given a point and you're given slope, it's important for you to use point-slope form. So we're going to start with y minus, and we're going to fill in our y value, which is 3. And we're going to say equals our m value outside x minus, and we fill in our x value, which is 1. And now we get y minus 3 equals negative x plus 1. We add 3, we get y equals negative x plus 4. And there you found it, your linear equation passing through those two points. Not so bad. Uh, two important things for you to know about linear functions. Sometimes they are, are in a constant form, which essentially just means uh, there would say f of x equals a number, f of x equals c. And the graph of a constant linear function would look something like this. Uh, say we have the value 1, 2, 3. Let's label our graphs here. And if we had a perfectly horizontal line going right through 3, the equation of this line would be f of x equals 3. And that's an example of a constant function. Uh, an identity function, identity linear function, looks like this. Where we have f of x equals perhaps x or just 2x or 3x or something with just the x value. And you don't have the b or you don't have the y-intercept. That would just mean... Uh, for example... Let's make our points, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 1, 2. Uh, if we had the function that did this, started at 0, went up 2 over 1, up 2 over 1, went down 2 over 1, this guy we would call f of x equals 2x, because we started at 0, we went up 2 over 1, up 2 over 1. 
uh, remember when there's no b attached, it's an identity, and when there's just a constant, it's the constant linear function. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, next, what I'd like to discuss is just a bunch of different kinds of common graphs that you should really get familiar with if you're not already. Uh, the first is the quadratic function. And remember, the quadratic is that classic parabola shape. And it's important, you should know some basic points of the, the quadratic. Uh, if we have f of x equals x squared, that's our parent function for the quadratic. And we know there's a point at 0, 0. Let's make some more things out here. 4, let's call this one 3. And here we go. Okay. Uh, there's always a point at 1, 1, negative 1, 1, at 2, 4, and at negative 2, 4. And you can just make those five points and then make your nice little U shape. Uh, the domain of this function, as you can see, it has arrows on either end, so it's going to be all real numbers. The range, however, clearly has a beginning, right? If we look from bottom to top, it looks like it begins here at 0. So we would say y is greater than or equal to 0, because we have an intercept at 0, 0. Let's make sure we label that as well. An intercept at 0, 0. And that's why we can say greater than or equal to, because we include that point. And it's also important, uh, <laughs> important, wow, important to understand that this is an intercept and a minimum right here. Uh, and we should also identify that this is symmetric about the y-axis. The cubic function, classic cubic function looks like this, f of x equals x cubed. Oh my gosh, squared cubed, cool. And the cubic function looks a little different. If we have points out here, let's call this one 2, 1, 2, 3, let's call this one 4. There we go. Uh, what our cubic function does is something like this, kind of comes up, touches the middle, goes out, and just kind of goes up. This isn't a perfect cubic function. It would look a little bit more <laughs> the same on this side. My drawing's not that good. Uh, but it's important for us to understand that this is, and you know what? Go back to your quadratic, write something else for me. Make sure you write that this is an even function. If we were to substitute in a negative x, we would get the same function, which makes it even. Over here, uh, the cubic function is always going to be odd because if we substituted in a negative x, we would get a negative function, the opposite of our function, so it would be odd. Uh, the domain here, let's just keep writing in red. Let's make this stand out. Okay. The domain here, again, since we have the arrows going forever this way, forever this way, is all real numbers. The range, similar thing, arrows forever down, forever up, so all real numbers again. Uh, we have that intercept right here at 0, 0. Let's so make sure we identify that. And lastly, uh, we need to identify that this is symmetric about the origin. All right. Next one, let's talk about the square root function. Another classic one for us to get familiar with. And that looks like f of x equals square root of x, just like it sounds. When we graph this, it's important for you to know some basic points again. So we would go up, let's call this 1, 2, and let's call this 1, 3. Let's go out 1, 2, 3, 4. Uh, there's always going to be a point at 1, 1, and at 4, 2. And we have the intercept at 0, 0 as well. All right, that's our classic square root function. And the domain x is greater than or equal to 0, the range y is greater than or equal to 0, and both of those make a lot of sense when we consider our original function. We know that we can't have negative numbers or numbers that are less than 0 under a radical, so we know x 
uh, has to be always greater than or equal to zero. And given that x, all of our inputs, are greater than or equal to zero, uh, our y values are also greater than or equal to zero because we have no negative things going on here. Uh, it's also important for us to identify that there's an intercept at zero, zero. Again, we can include zero. The zeros are allowed in radicals. That works. Uh, the reciprocal function, the classic one, looks like this. f of x equals 1 over x. And what this graph does, kind of cool, uh, let's just give ourselves some points here. Make sure to always label your graphs well like I do in your notes. That's always a good thing for you to do. Uh, and what the reciprocal function does is it has asymptotes, a vertical asymptote at zero and a horizontal asymptote at zero. And so it gets really, really close to zero on both sides there, but it never actually touches. Uh, and that being said, we're going to consider that when we write out our domain and our range. Let's keep writing in red. That was fun. I like how it shows up. All right. So our domain, if we take a look at this, it looks like we have all of our x values. Like They just never stop. We have an arrow going forever this way. So we know, okay, negative infinity over here. And we come in, we come in, we come in, and then we get really, really, really close to zero, but we never actually touch it because we have that vertical asymptote. So we go from negative infinity to zero, and again, we don't include zero because we have that asymptote there. We get close to it, but we don't include it. And then, after zero, it looks like our x values continue, and they just keep going. So again, really, really, really close to zero, here's that vertical asymptote, and then we just go out. So we go from zero to positive infinity. Our range is doing the exact same behavior, right? If we go from the bottom, up, it looks like we go all the way down to negative infinity, and we come up, we come up, we come up, and then we get here, and our function just gets super close, super close to zero, but never actually touches it. So we say negative infinity to zero, and then again, we have that arrow going forever upward, so we have positive infinity, but it never actually touches zero. So we say the union of zero to positive infinity. And again, if we look at our original function, this makes sense because uh, we can never have zero in the bottoms of fractions. We can't ever do that. And so uh, because the numerator is 1, that means our output would also never be zero. Uh, it would always be some value either smaller or bigger than zero, but it never could actually be zero in our output. And then, again, it's obvious that we can, we can just throw a zero in here to the bottom of a fraction uh, because that would become undefined. And we can see that clearly by our graph. Undefined vertical asymptote, undefined horizontal asymptote. All right, let's talk about the last one of these graphs I'm going to throw at you. Absolute value. Absolute value is that classic uh, V-shape. Uh, let's call this 1 and 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, and 1, 2, okay. Uh, absolute value is the intercept at the origin, at least its parent function does. And then we have points 1, 1, negative 1, 1, 2, 2, negative 2, 2, and it just makes that V shape, that sharp corner. And for our domain, when we start writing out all these things again, our domain, as you can see, arrow forever left, arrow forever right, so we know it's going to include all real numbers. For our range, however, there's clearly a beginning from our bottom values. If we go up from the bottom, we see they start at zero, and then they go arrows upward. So we can say y is greater than or equal to zero. Uh, let's see. It's also important, let's identify that this is an even function. Uh, if we were to substitute in, hang on, make sure you write that your original function looks like this. That's important. Okay. If we were to substitute in a negative x uh, to our function, then we would see that that would make no difference. It would keep it the exact same original function. 
so that's why it's even. Uh, it's important, let's identify there's an intercept at 0, 0. And it's symmetric about the y-axis. Remember we talked about if it's even, it's all automatically symmetric about the y. And we can see that with every one of these we've identified as even. All right. Uh, let's talk about step functions. And next to step, write the word, the little acronym, uh, AKA, greatest integer. function. And what the greatest integer function says is that it looks like this. It has a little like double bracket thing going on. Let me make that a little bit closer so you guys can see it a little bit better. There we go. It's got a little double bracket going on on either side of x. It's a little funky thing. And in words what this means is the greatest integer less than or equal to x. Integer less than or equal to x. So if we have the function f of x equals this greatest integer of x. Uh, and we wanted to find, let's find a few values. Let's here do an example. This is an example. Let's call it so. So if we wanted to do f of negative 1, well, then we would throw negative 1 in here. And we ask ourselves that question. Uh, greatest integer uh, that is less than or equal to negative 1. Well, the greatest one next to it is negative 1. If we wanted to find of 1 half, or pardon me, negative 1 half, again we ask ourselves the greatest integer less than or equal to negative 1 half is going to be again negative 1. Uh, of one tenth. Well, the greatest integer that's less than or equal to one tenth is going to be zero. Right? One tenth is really close to zero. Uh, and if we had, let's say, three halves. the greatest integer less than or equal to 3 halves would be just 1. And so when we graph this whole thing out, I can actually show you in the calculator if I find where I put there it is. Okay. So to graph the greatest integer function, here's what it looks like. Let's do it by hand first, and then I'll show you the calculator. All right, so if we have a coordinate plane, and we do 1, 2, 3, call that 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. Okay. Uh, what this does is, if we were to throw in, let's say, uh, 0 into the greatest integer function, well, uh, then we could include 0. We'd start at 0. And it would still be 0 until we got to 1. And then at 1, the output, the answer, would be 1. And it would continue to be 1 for all values of x until we got to 2. And then when we're actually at 2, 
our y value, our output, would be the number 2. Uh, and it would continue to be 2 until we got to 3, and so on and so forth. And it works backwards as well. Uh, it would be negative 1 until we got to 0, and then it would be 0. Oh, those points were pretty close together, but you get the point. Sometimes my graphs don't look that pretty, but uh, they do prove the points I'm trying to make. Okay. So we can see this is why they call it the step function. I mean, it's pretty clear now. It goes up, it steps, it steps, it steps. It kind of just does this jump every single time. Uh, and in your calculator, here's how you can do that. Uh, if you wanted to put it in your y equals, let's uh, expose this a little bit more. Let's try this. There you go. Now you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, if you go to math, and then you go down to number, and you go down to int, it should give you... Ooh, am I doing that right? Let's go down to number... And yes, I am doing that right. So if you wanted to do the integer and then we would throw in x in there, right, the grace integer of x, and we press graph, we can see that our graph is doing that step just like we did by hand. Uh, and you can also go to your y equals and you can uh, make sure that you have this in uh, dot mode. I'm going to go and change mine to dot, and you can see what I'm doing a little bit better right there. I press OK. And now if we press graph, oh, we still get some dots. That's OK. I'll show you how to do that in your calculator tomorrow because I know your calculators are a little bit different than mine. Uh, but that's how you would do that. You would go to math and then go to integer. All right. Let's talk about piece size, and then I'll leave you alone. Alright, uh, zooming out a little bit here. That's better. Okay. Piecewise. A lot of the time, students get intimidated by these, and I'd like to make them a little bit less scary if I could. Uh, essentially, uh, if you have a piecewise function, you have your f of x equals. Then you have this fancy bracket, and it tells you a few different things that are going on. Uh, usually at least two. Uh, you would have maybe, for example, 2x plus... Oh, pardon me, that's supposed to be 3. 2x plus 3. Uh, and then you would have comma, and this is for x is less than or equal to 1. You would maybe then, you could have the function negative x plus 4, comma, x is greater than 1. So this is the nature of piecewise functions. You have a function, and then you have a condition. A function and a condition. And at, when you graph them, just know that you are graphing both of these, uh, but you're starting or stopping based on the condition. So let's graph this by hand to make this not so scary. Get your coordinate plane going. Uh, let's call this 1, 2, 3, 4, five, six up here. Let's go out one, two, three, four, five, negative five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three. Okay, beautiful. Uh, let's begin with the top function, a 2x plus 3. That's just a linear function. That's an mx plus b. So I'm going to start at my b beginning, up at 3. That's where I'm going to begin. And then I'm going to use my slope to make my next point. I'm going to go up to over 1. And notice, once I go over to that 1, I am now at the end of my condition, right? I'm, I want to be 2x plus 3 for everything less than 1. So I'm going to start here and I'm going to go backwards. I'm going to go down 2 over 1, down 2 over 1, down 2 over 1. I've made all my points, so now I'm just going to connect them. All right, and then I draw my arrow out here to the left. Notice I am not drawing an arrow out in this direction because that's not true. This 
This graph, 2x plus 3, stops here. This graph stops as soon as we get to 1, and then it's everything smaller than 1. And notice I also put a closed circle here at the end, because this is valid for everything less than or equal to 1. So I must have a closed dot at 1. Now, uh, for everything greater than 1, right, here's 1, everything greater than 1, I need to be the function negative x plus 4. So I'm going to kind of just like shadow draw that. If I start up here at 4, don't draw anything, but just sort of create your line. So if I started at 4 and I had a negative x slope or a negative 1 slope, I would go down 1, over 1. So I know there's going to be a point here. And what I'm going to do is I'm not going to draw a closed circle. I'm going to draw an open circle. And this is why. I do not have a greater than or equal to. I only have a greater than. So I'm going to leave that open. I can't include 1 for this function. Uh, now I just keep on making the points in that direction. So I continue to go down 1, over 1, down 1, over 1, down 1, over 1, down 1, over 1. And once I connect all my points, I'm sure to put an arrow at the end of that because that function for continues for everything greater than 1. All the way to infinity it continues. And that is the graph of our piecewise. Let's identify a few things. The domain, uh, we have an arrow forever this way, an arrow forever this way, and when we get to this weird jumpy thing, that's okay. We can actually say that the domain is all real numbers because we get to include 1 on this function. And so it doesn't matter we don't include it here. It is included in one function. So x is covered for everything, for all negative and all positive infinity, every number ever. Uh, range is not the same thing. Uh, it does look like there's no bottom, right? Our arrows go forever downward, so we, ha we go all the way to negative infinity. But it does look like there's a very clear top, and the top occurs at 5. So what we're going to say is, y is everything below 5, y is less than or equal to, this is a closed dot, or equal to 5. Uh, then we can identify two things. This function is increasing on the interval. Our slope is positive for this function, for the 2x plus 3. So we can say the function is increasing for everything less than or equal to 1, or from negative infinity to 1. Uh, we can say that it's decreasing for everything on this function, for negative x plus 4. So, for the interval 1 to positive infinity. But here's the thing, I have that closed circle, so I'm going to say parenthesis 1 to positive infinity. Alright, that's all I have to show you. I'll see you guys tomorrow in class.